Dr. Stephen Best, who is uh, with the Michigan Department of Education, although I first got to know him when he was over with at the University of Michigan. And so uh, he was, at the time that I got to know him, he was kind of the guru of, a, of a mobile computing. So that, that's kind of the context that I, I first knew him at, uh, through McCall, which is the Michigan Association of Computer Users and Learning, which is sort of the, uh, the, the, the trade association, if you will, for teachers who like to use technology. Um, so I've, I've known Steve for a while, and then he moved over to MBE, and uh, I was, Steve, I was tempted to have you wear like a wizard's hat and an outfit for this. Um, but he gave this talk uh, about a year ago, and, and it was sort of a, what's coming down the pike in education. From his vantage point at the Michigan Department of Education, Steve can kind of see um, over the mountains, if you will, while the rest of us might just see the forest. So he can see kind of what's coming on the horizon. And what I thought would be interesting is that a lot of things he's going to talk about are going to be as you are freshly baked as teachers, some of you finishing uh, next year, some of you the year after. Uh, so that means you'll be in your first year or two of teaching, but some of these things that Steve talks about start to come about. So it's, it's kind of exciting, I guess, that you'll be there in a time of, uh, of change and then innovation, and maybe a little bit terrifying because some of your colleagues will see things that they've been used to for a long time start to go away. And they might even look to you for some leadership, if nothing else, being young and flexible, and maybe heard of some of this stuff coming along. You might find yourself unexpectedly helping lead the charge in some areas. So, is that fair, Steve? What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to Steve, and he's going to take us through the rest of the afternoon. If you have questions, he's going to pause at a couple of different times, and then if you wouldn't mind just using the microphone here. Um, to talk, I'm going to leave it on the desk, and I'm going to sit up here myself as well. So uh, if you need to, to ask a question, uh, I may come and give you the microphone just so he can hear it better. Okay, Steve, it's all yours. Great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So as uh, as uh, Professor Rubio stated, uh, I wanted to really try and focus on some different innovations um, that are going along. The, um, one of the parts of the name of the office that I work in is the Edu Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. And I think often when people are thinking of state departments of education, they're typically not thinking of innovation. They're typically thinking of compliance and rules and accountability. But uh, there are a lot of things that we're actually working on to really try and teach what education looks like and, and move some interesting policies along. So some of these are a little more um, grounded and, and ready to go. In fact, some of them are, are in some early uh, pilot stages now. Some of them are policies that are being looked at very seriously in the state that, but haven't yet been um, fully adopted that, are, that we're imagining will likely be seen in schools in the next uh, in the next three to five years in, in most cases. So um, what I'd like to do is first just kind of start out with some basic ideas about innovation itself and, and some things to think about in, uh, in schools and classrooms of, around this notion of innovating what we do and then uh, get into some actual examples of this. So um, when talking about innovation, one of the things that I'm often drawn to is, is this particular quote. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Daniel Berman, who, if any of you are familiar with uh, him in US history, he, he was actually an architect and urban planner and was the planner of, in, for the city of Chicago during the Columbian Exposition in 1893. And, uh, this work, I think, really kind of sets this, this quote really sets the stage for some of what we're thinking of. Um, it says, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans, aim high and, and hope and work. And so a lot of what you're going to see today is really not something where we're trying to just modify or tweak the system, but we're really thinking about some different ways in which we can look at education and learning that really kind of gets away from the history that we've had for 
well over 100 years in classrooms that, that in many classrooms hasn't actually changed in, in that last century. So, um, so first I wanted to get at this notion of what innovation really means um, and what we're talking about with this. So you can see the definition here on the screen. It's to make changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. And what we basically wanted to get to is we wanted to get at this notion that we're not looking just at simple improvement. Improvement is a notion where you're looking at the practices you are currently engaged in now, and you're figuring out based upon data or evidence coming out of those practices, what things could we modify or tweak or, or adjust in some way to, to get a little improvement, to, to move the bar and inch or so. By innovation, we're really thinking of something completely different. So thinking of the, these two things, and this is really grounded in research on innovation. The first is this notion of different outcomes. Now, part of what we're doing in introducing innovations is to get at very different ideas on, on what students will be able to do when they're coming out of school. Um, I, I like this graphic in particular because uh, I've been using it as well as I've been doing a lot of uh, discussions around the new science standards. And for those of you who may be familiar with those standards, they really look at the notion of changing what we're doing in science instruction so that we're not simply looking at a lot of facts around science but rather looking at engaging students in doing science. And, and so it's a kind of three-dimensional picture of, of uh, science and the same here. So, so part of what we're going to look at in all of these uh, different innovations that I, that I want to introduce to you today is something where we are looking at different outcomes than we have had in our education system. The other part of this is to really look at different processes and I love this particular picture here for a lot of reasons, but uh, one of the reasons is I am reminded of another quote, um, and the quote is from Henry Ford, where he was asked about the designs of the Model T and and why he didn't take more input from people, and, and one of his comments was, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And I think that really gets at the notion of a lot of what we're going to be looking at here is we don't simply want to take the education system that we have and ramp it up a level. Because a lot of what we are seeing in our system, and, and we see this very much at the state level, is we're seeing a lot of compliance, but not a lot of creativity. We're seeing a lot of examples of um, through practices like uh, through standardized assessment and through accountability in schools, which the hope for those policies was to really try and motivate schools to, to introduce change. And what it's really resulted in is anything but that. It's resulted in a lot of schools just driving home for redundant practices a whole lot more. So we're really looking to get out of this. So when we're thinking of innovation, um, the, the body of research on innovation really suggests that there are six components to innovation that really come up in terms of any particular innovation that you're introducing is going to have to deal with these six issues. So um, very briefly, they are the following. They're starting at the bottom of this slide. Utility, it's usefulness. It's still something innovative can't just be different for creativity's sake, but it has to have some use to it. And so utility is a, a critical component of this. However, that notion of creativity, you know, working our way counterclockwise around, creativity is also a, a component of this as well, in that we are looking at different outcomes and different uh, processes. It has to be something that's feasible. Um, uh, Professor Rubio spoke about technology and handheld technologies and, and um, about 10 years ago, actually a little more than that, about 15 years ago, I was first doing some work around handheld tools 
in uh, schools using palm pilots and other things. At the time, that was not a terribly feasible tool. It was something that was kind of cutting edge, but the notion of introducing that for all students to have and have universal access to was really kind of um, really not a commonplace notion because because of the cost, because of breakability factors, because of all sorts of limitations on the technology. And yet, when we might talk about that today, it would seem totally easy because many of our students are coming into the classroom with these tools in their hands already. So feasibility is a component. Efficacy is another one. Ef efficacy is the notion of really trying to have the innovation reach the intended goals that we're setting for, for that particular innovation. The last two are, are two that really often come up as barriers and challenges of innovation, but they are components. One is risk, and uh, along with it, resistance. Um, so risk is the notion that if you are trying some new innovation, that you're giving something up in the process. And that potential for what you are giving up um, often it is a, a barrier to to implementing any new innovation in that many people are afraid of, of that kind of uh, cost of what they are giving up. It, is it too much? We see this often in schools with accountability considerations where some schools that are performing actually rather poorly um, in the state, we're trying to encourage innovation and yet there's an aversion to um, trying to do anything risky even though they're not having success with their existing practices. So risk um, is a factor and that brings up this last notion of resistance that there's inherent resistance to change in almost anything that we do. And so a lot of um, what we see innovation in innovations is um, some inherent resistance, but often the innovations themselves have have some mechanism for dealing with the resistance that people have, um, whether it's through introducing new technologies and tools that people find so universally valuable um, that they want to bring into the classroom, to other kinds of policies and practices where um, if you can reduce the resistance that people have to this new idea or change, whether it's through professional development for teachers to learn about the new tool, or whether it's through a policy change to, to encourage the use of the new tool. Um, these are all components that we're going to be thinking about with all of these uh, ideas that I want to introduce to you. So there's one other way that I wanted to frame out this idea around innovation before getting into the actual innovations. And that's the notion of um, looking at the impact and looking at the scale of whatever this innovation may be. So when we're looking at these things, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find something, at least at the state level, that can have great impact, will be very high in the, on the impact scale here on the vertical scale, and be able to scale to the entire state. We don't want to do something where we're working with a group of, say, 10 teachers because there are 110,000 teachers in the state. Um, we need to be able to, to deal with large scale here. So first of all, what we often see in efforts that are introduced as innovations are a lot of efforts that really don't have a whole lot of impact uh, and they don't really scale. There's something that a teacher tries in their classroom that they didn't really assess or, or see what the outcome would be. And so we have a lot of unproven um, efforts that uh, are introduced as innovations. Sometimes these efforts scale largely, but they still don't have any real, uh, real information about what the impact on these has been. And I'll give a good example. Educational technology is, is one of these things. Not that this is a, a bad thing at all, it's, and, and I, myself, and Professor Rubio, and, and countless others around the state have found great value in this, but it's often hard to document the impact of this. So these are efforts that sometimes become very popular, but we may not be able to see the direct impact from it. 
On the opposite side of these, sometimes we see some significant impact, but uh, it's hard to scale. I'll give an example of this. Uh, um, in a small town north of you, in, in the town of Stockbridge, um, there are a number of teachers who have been working on some British robotics projects and introducing project-based learning. Now, you've probably heard a lot about project-based learning, so you may be engaging in some different efforts around this. Often these efforts are very creative, and, and we found a lot of um, impact, but we found the impact in only a few classrooms because only a few teachers have been willing to um, take on that risk and deal with the, the kind of social, emotional resistance that they may have to find those kinds of practices. So we end up with creative ideas, but not necessarily something that becomes what we're looking for here, which is an innovation. Something that is able to scale and able to show de demonstrable impact across the board in terms of the outcomes that we're looking at, whatever they are. So this is also just to frame this notion of innovation. Um, one last thing I wanted to kind of introduce is, is the notion of barriers to innovation as well. I talked about a few of these during the, those six components to innovation. Um, and uh, I wanted to kind of address these a little bit more. So some of these kind of come along <laughs> the lines of this. This particular slide, which or the image here, was one I took when I was teaching um, quite a few years ago uh, back in Hawaii of a uh, lava field that just happened to cross the road right at the stop sign. You're clearly not going to go through the, the stop sign here. We, we want to introduce these, these barriers as, as the same kind of thing, things that we need to avoid um, so that we don't get burned by 2,000 <laughs> degree lava. Um, or they're metaphorical example here through innovation. So a couple of these that, that come up are introducing some new idea that actually doesn't address a need. Um, another example is going it alone. We often see a lot of innovative teachers who try new and amazing, interesting things, but are doing this on their own. And often they're, they're dedicating a great amount of time and energy to this but kind of burning out in the process. And so these are some challenges we see. Other examples include lacking a vision for where you actually want to go. You might be introducing some new idea or concept, but not really have an idea of what the outcome for, for this really looks like. Um, some others that come up along the way, I'll just kind of briefly get on some of these. Incomplete communication around what the innovation is so that people don't really understand what it is. Um, ignoring some of the barriers that pop up. Obvious barriers are things like cost, um, but uh, some of the less obvious barriers are um, people's internal resistance to change, whatever it may be, even it seem, if it seems like a very, very positive outcome. Um, often we see a lot of educators who try new innovations, and part of their plan is they're simply hoping for victory rather than planning for it. One thing we often find is to, to deal with that um, resistance to change is uh, true innovators find ways to plan for early victories so that no matter what, their, their first steps out are successful, they're not kind of tripping over themselves along the way. Um, but hopefully they're not doing number seven here, declaring victory too early in the process either, recognizing that uh, achieving some of these innovations uh, often takes a great deal of time when you're wanting to achieve these to the point of um, fidelity, uh, of seeing uh, people universally use the kind of innovation in the way that it's, that it's been promoted. And then the eighth here is not institutionalizing the innovation, not, not making it a part of the day-to-day -day habits of school, but keeping it as something that's this special extra thing Often when that happens, we see innovations just become the special extra thing, not become the norm. So, so with that said, um, before getting into some of the actual innovations here, I do I have a list of ten of these. Let me just see if there are any quick questions among you um, before we before we get into the details. Has anybody got a question? And if not, I'll take this up with the soda here and move on. 
I think they're soaking it up, Steve. Keep going. All right, here we go then. Okay, so getting into these. So the first of these is uh, a focus on competency and skills. And this seems like a kind of obvious one for education, but our education policy has said really anything but this. Um, often our policy has been directed at seat time and at content kinds of information. Um, we see this in our policies around the amount of time we spend in school, and we see it in our policies around uh, what, what counts for progress for students. So seat time, um, we actually have laws in the state saying students need to be in, in school uh, in credit-bearing classes for 1,098 hours. And next year, you'd be in fact in eight years in schools that are dealing with some of these changes right now. Next year, in, in our state, we move up from, excuse me, 175 days to 180 days in the required school calendar. Um, which is kind of a foolish notion. It's, it's all based on seat time and figuring that seat time is a proxy for student learning. If they're sitting there long enough, they must be taking in some certain amount of information and ideas. And as we know, that's not really the case. Often it means that uh, we're just spending a lot of time uh, in classrooms and schools, but not really focusing on developing deep understandings or developing competency or skill. So, so we're seeing a move toward personalized learning um, at, at the statewide level. We, we've always seen this kind of thing at the classroom level where, where teachers are open to trying to address the unique and individual needs of students in their own classroom. But we're seeing now more, much more policy directed this way. And the idea behind it is that we're getting away from this notion of grades as a proxy for what students can do. And, and if you think about this notion of what we have had for well over 100 years as using some letter to represent what a student knows about uh, a particular topic over the course of a year or a semester or whatever amount of time, it's really kind of a foolish notion. And it was always done in the, in the form of simplifying the process for educators and simplifying record keeping to basically say there's this social um, social idea about what an A is in our schools, what a B is, and, and so on. And so we've always kind of used that as a proxy for what kids know, but, but it's harder and harder to really understand what that A really means. Does it, does it mean that the student has a particular set of skills or understandings about that content, or does it mean that they just went through and did a lot of worksheets in that particular topic? So what we're seeing more now is a focus on competency and skill-based learning. The notion is we're going to see more um, work happening across the state, focusing on students developing portfolios of their work, on uh, educators then using those portfolios to document sets of skills that students have. Some of this comes about in some of our newer standards that we have in the different course areas, um, uh, or course topics in math, English, language, arts, science. Those standards, um, while they do address some content kind of understanding, they're often addressing uh, skills and some deeper understandings now with, the, with some of the newer standards we have. They used to be very much focused on just a lot of rote content, but now they're focusing really on being able to analyze information, being able to synthesize information, and bring new ideas and concepts in or apply this in new ways. And we're seeing um, some different ways now that educators can actually document this process. So we're no longer getting in the notion of simply giving a grade to show what a student can do, but actually showing what a student can do uh, realistically because the technology that we have now actually allows much more information to be you know, demonstrated, so to speak, in, in reporting on, on what students are able to accomplish. So in other words, some of this comes down to the report card and the, and the uh, database of, of tracking uh, a student's record through time over, over the 
course of their school experience. And we're seeing a lot more focus on personalizing this, depending on the needs of the student, on students having their own pace for things so that we don't have to have every student doing every single thing at the very same time all together in one class, but rather students being able to demonstrate their competency and different skills at different points in time with different groups, um, and then developing individualized learning plans for those students as we go. So this is going to be a big kind of policy. There's a lot of things underway for, for this now already. Um, there are more things that will kind of come with this idea. So a second piece that comes with this, and, and this is really kind of the, the, uh, the twin to this particular idea I talked about in the first one, is having some way to recognize those competencies and skills. And so one of the tools that we're seeing um, developing out, it's, it's been in early use in the last couple of years, um, and my guess is this will become the norm that we move to in the next five years in our schools, is this notion of digital badging. It's gonna sound like an odd notion, but um, if you think of the idea of badging from the, uh, from uh, organizations like the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. For any of you who have participated in that particular uh, uh, work, you know that people can earn a badge for demonstrating some particular practice. So someone can earn their archery badge for being able to shoot an arrow a certain distance or you know, whatever the case may be. And they earn this little badge that can get sewn on their vest. Well, the notion of a digital badge is basically the notion of being able to provide some electronic equivalent that shows a demonstrated competency in a particular um, practice or in a skill or understanding a concept. And so um, we're seeing something called the Open Badges Project in fact, Michigan um, is one of the first states to initiate this for uh, education efforts around the state. It's, it's a process where basically there's an electronic badge that can kind of follow you around through both social media and through the databases that schools use to track student information. And what that badge can do is it not only is just kind of another way of showing a demonstrated competency, but it's a specific platform for how you can demonstrate that and actually embed some of the student work in there. So if, for instance, students were creating a video of a particular idea that they were able to demonstrate, they could incorporate that video and it becomes part of the badge. The badge is a way of showing some confidence that a large group has agreed to. And so, one good example of this that we have actually going this year is with a project called the uh, FIRST Robotics Program. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a statewide program that uh, has students largely in either in a class mode or in an extracurricular program um, uh, designing different kinds of robots that perform various functions. Um, engaging in competitions around this, and, and they have all sorts of different activities that they're involved in with this. The group of educators who have been really at the lead of this effort have developed a, a set of competencies that now result in these badges so that students who are participating in the project, if they're able to complete these specific set of tasks or demonstrate some understanding of a particular concept, maybe it's around electrical design, maybe it's around mechanical design or around marketing because that's a component of, of this particular program, then they've met a particular threshold. There's a rubric that's used to evaluate progress and those educators who are giving the badge have basically said, if you can demonstrate these particular things, you've earned the badge. It sounds a lot like rating, it sounds like maybe just a kind of fancy add-on for this, but the beauty of this is that 
colleges and universities are finding this kind of thing more and more useful because they're recognizing, first of all, that the grading system that we've had for years really didn't tell them all the kinds of things they needed to know. It was a proxy for student understanding. Here they can actually see, if they want to, they can dig into the actual data and see what was the student actually able to do. And there's a lot of tools that come with this now to be able to help easily evaluate batches so that so that colleges and universities aren't having to basically do the equivalent of opening a lot of documents one at a time and seeing what students can do, but actually able to use the badging um, kind of software on the end user side to be able to see what are all these students able to demonstrate and, and who might demonstrate something that stands out from the crowd and someone. So this is a new process. Um, it's being used now in a few examples here. Quite honestly, uh, we're looking at this um, representing some different modes of dealing with our, what has been grading in schools. And um, it's something that has become so widespread in certain areas of the economy, especially areas like computer programming and a lot of other digital media work where the technology evolved so fast that college and university classes couldn't really keep up in terms of uh, having up-to-date information. Basically, by the time a college or a university was able to design a course in that particular topic, it was obsolete and they moved on to the next thing. This kind of tool is now presenting a, a different way of looking at this that also allows for demonstrating confidence without having to say, I sat through this many hours of this particular class it's more saying, I can do this particular thing. I have this set of skills. And the, the badge is the kind of emblem of that or representation of that. OK. Getting away from that, looking at some other aspects of education. A third innovation that uh, we're very seriously looking at. I apologize, by the way, for the lighting here. I'm suddenly getting very bright because of the eagle of the sun here. Um, uh, third one here is placing learning opportunities at optimal ages. Um, one particular example here that uh, this, this bit of student work is showing is one around languages. Um, this is one of several examples, but a lot of what we've been looking at in, in some of these kinds of innovations is we're looking at the, the time of particular set of skills or, or um, a particular class topic might be taught. And, and now that we're learning a lot more about how the brain actually works and learning through um, this generally new field of neuroscience, we're coming to understand that our brain's capacities over time change in, in a variety of ways. And something that we used to do in back in, while well, we still do, frankly, in 95% of our schools, is we, we say that certain things need to wait until a particular time when the student's mature enough to, to learn this. And one of those is foreign language. Most foreign languages in, in many of Michigan school systems are taking place primarily at the high school level. Sometimes there's an introduction of foreign language in the middle school. But that's, that's often been the case for many, many years. Part of what we're seeing now is that neuroscience is telling us that the optimal time for students to be able to develop new understandings about language actually is much earlier in their life. And in fact, often is taking place well before they're ever in school. But we don't have that opportunity to reach students at age one and two when they're developing their own language capacities in their primary language to, to add a new language at that time. So we are seeing schools that are doing a lot of this in early immersion programs. Um, we're seeing uh, more and more schools around the state um, adopt language immersion programs where the, um, the, the regular course content that students get, or at least a part of the content that they get, um, from a very early age, typically kindergarten, um, on up, 
is introduced in a different language. Um, I will give one example of that of my daughters, actually. Uh, both of my daughters are um, have gone through a, an immersion program where all of their instruction in starting in kindergarten was in Spanish. And so what we're seeing from that is students who uh, end up by the end of fourth or fifth grade are fully fluent not only in their home language of typically English, but also in this other language that they've been immersed in for years in the classroom. And so we see students who are fully bilingual by, by the age of nine or 10. That's a trend that we see continuing to develop. And we're seeing more and more focus on placing these kinds of learning opportunities at the ages in which students are better able to um, demonstrate better able to kind of work with and grasp the, the different concepts that they're dealing with. So language is one of those that um, a lot of neuroscience is suggesting that the capacity still exists when you're adults or when you're my age and lost your hair and everything else, but, um, but really that capacity is diminished by that time. That the younger the, the student is, the more likely they're to have that capacity. So we're seeing more and more of these kinds of things develop. Similar for other kind of content areas in terms of when different topics are introduced. Um, there's, for instance, a much bigger focus on introduction of some abstract concepts such as um, uh, algebraic reasoning early on in uh, a student's experience. Even though they may not fully have the numeracy skills to be able to do a lot of computation, um, sometimes we can still introduce that notion of what happens when we add some unknown number. If I add three plus X and I get some other number five from that. Just those simple kinds of uh, ideas placed at a different age sometimes reduces the barriers that we then see later on. And so for instance, as a lot of these kinds of concepts have been introduced in elementary grades math, programs, we've seen a significant reduction in the number of people who, um, when they transition into that first algebra class, often uh, in middle school or from middle school to high school, um, the number of students kind of failing that experience, so to speak, has diminished significantly. So that's that's another innovation that we're seeing across the board is, is placing these learning opportunities at different ages. Let me introduce one more here, and uh, and then I'll see if there might be some other questions as we go. So a fourth one here is um, centered on this notion of engaging learners in authentic work. And this often gets represented as project-based learning, or hands-on learning, or all sorts of other names that get attributed to it. But, but the idea is basically this, that um, gone from the kind of classroom that, that now engages in authentic work are those, um, those learning experiences that were based upon just manufactured ideas, like um, the, the infamous one I remember from my childhood is, if a train is going from Detroit to Chicago at such and such a speed and another train the opposite direction, well, those kinds of experiences really are not relatable for kids. And so more of the kinds of things that we're seeing as, um, as not just a, a few rare cases, but as more and more of a common practice in schools is engaging learners in authentic work where they are working on a tangible program uh, or activity where they can see the outcome and it has meaning to them. Um, where it's also something where they have a role in constructing some of this work. Um, you will find a lot of names applied to this, whether it's authentic learning, whether it's deeper learning, whether it's project-based learning, whatever the case may be. But it is this notion of really focusing on work that kids no longer have the question about why is this relevant or important, because they can see the tangible process of doing this in whatever they are doing. Some of the pictures here are some examples from this kind of instruction where kids were investigating 
issues of water quality, or they were engaged in doing an archaeological dig, and, and they're seeing tangible results of this kind of work. It's often the kind of thing, too, that those who are of my generation or, or others who have been out of the K-12 experience when asked to reflect on what was the what was one of the best learning experiences you've ever had in school? Often people will pick experiences that are very much like this, where there was something authentic. They were creating a particular product or, or doing something that felt much more real and useful and relevant to them. And so that, that notion of ownership is one that is a critical piece of this work. It also allows for much deeper learning and, and much more, more deep, deeper investigation in, into a particular topic or idea. So with that said, I'm going to do one quick thing. I'm just going to shut some blinds here because I'm, I'm seeing myself turn even wider than I am here um, in the room. And uh, let, me, let me turn some blinds and see if there's any questions from the group uh, while, you are, uh, while you are there. Okay, so another pause. Any, any questions at this point? Steve, I think you, I think you've still got him fully and fully in front at this point. So I think. Oh uh, well, that's good. Excellent. Okay, well, so let me move on then, um, and hopefully, if I'm not at least blinding myself, that was another reason to close those blinds. Okay, so a fifth innovation here. Um, some of these, by the way, they don't seem all that innovative, but if you look in schools, like that notion of authentic learning, go look in a lot of classrooms and you're not gonna see a whole lot of authentic learning taking place day after day after day. You're still gonna see a lot of worksheets. You're still gonna see a lot of um, doing problems out of a book that don't really have tangible uh, um, relevance to students and so, so um, unfortunately, this is kind of the policy side of things. I, we love if we can see those kinds of authentic experiences, but they don't become common. So that's, that's where a lot of the work that I'm trying to address is, is trying to make these all commonplace. So wherever you are in the, in the state, we're seeing some of these efforts. So number five here on the list is focusing on strategies for developing learning models. Um, and not the content alone. And the idea behind this is that um, one of the critical components that we're, we're hearing from various people in the field, uh, whether ecologists, whether in the workplace, is that students often are, who are coming out of the education system are struggling in being able to apply their new learning or their learning to new ideas. And we recognize that. Um, a lot of what we are doing in the education system is really developing a set of skills for a learner that they can apply to new practices whenever they may take place. And so on the screen here, you, you see, for instance, some of the key cognitive strategies that we hope all students would have that, that they know how to hypothesize or, or strategize in, in formulating um, a problem, or they know how to engage in research by identifying and collecting information. Um, all of these kinds of things here. And so a big part of that is seeing a move toward a curriculum that introduces basically metacognition, the notion of being able to think about your own learning experience and express this in ways, even as a very young learner, to be able to express how we best learn and what kinds of um, what kinds of experiences we, we learn better in, what kinds of challenges we run into on an individual level. And so um, a lot of what we will be seeing in introduction of new kind of authentic problems and practices is a combination of those with this notion of um, reflecting on practice so that students can better learn how they as individuals learn that 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 they aren't a one-size-fits-all kind of situation but rather that um, they may have their own kinds of things that they work better with and that they process information better with um, and that they would then look for those opportunities in future learning 
future learning efforts that they're engaged in, whatever they are, that, that in a way they develop their own individualized learning plan. Um, it, it's a practice, um, this notion of individualizing learning plans is a practice that's very common, obviously, in special education where you're dealing with uh, students who may have a variety of challenges or impairments um, that they need to deal with every day and, and that educators are trying to find some specific ways that help deal help them deal with their scenarios. This is the same kind of notion applied universally. And so one of the things we're likely to see um, with students really in the, in the next five years is individualized learning plans where we're focusing on particular traits and qualities and skills that students bring as learners and talking about them with that so that they can better understand what can you better do next time or with a new problem to better learn and understand the things you need to do so that it also becomes um, an, an issue of ownership for students as they proceed forward. Okay, um, number six here is uh, one that probably gets at the kinds of things we normally think of as innovations in education. We, we often think of technologies and tools, and so um, that is very clearly one of the kinds of things that uh, we're seeing introduced far more widely as policy. I, I mentioned earlier the example of the FIRST Robotics program that really is available to pretty much every middle and high school in the state. Um, uh, that's a particular grant program where they can participate in this. We're seeing more and more efforts like this where we're seeing um, some different kinds of things being done with the technologies, but specifically to do new things so that the technology is not there to simply be a very, very expensive version of paper and pencil or a very expensive version of a book or whatever the case may be. Now granted, they through the internet and other things have a lot of efficiencies that you might have, not have when comparing them to something like a library. But a lot of the examples we're looking at here are, are basically saying, if we have all of these new tools, not only how can, we, how can we use the tools to do some of the things we have done before, but how can we do very new things with them? So some of the pictures here are examples of this where Students are basically creating, um, in, in the upper right, creating new musical instruments, trying to attribute different sounds to different kinds of tools so that they can um, use something as simple as, in, in this case, a, an electronic drum set to actually use it not only to create new sounds, but actually create new visual tools and be able to do on-the-fly video kinds of editing um, with the tools where you're actually drumming out an activity to demonstrate something, not just typing into a keyboard or anything else. Some of these are very old. Uh, an example here on the lower left is an example of students who, in this particular case, were designing and building a solar-powered car. Um, but using a lot of different tools that were available um, at the time to, to try a new thing. Um, here we see kind of the modern equivalent of this where students were using 3D printers and working with uh, students that had some physical impairments to basically create um, prosthetics that are customized to that individual. And this is actually taking place not as a part of a medical practice alone, but as, actually as part of a learning practice in schools where students are learning the programming skills to basically be able to design and create some of these new kinds of tools for, in, in this case, uh, an arm for, for this young young lady here. So um, we're seeing some very different kinds of practices that, that the technologies allow us to be able to do um, that just were never employed before. Those are some of the kinds of things that, that we're really trying to encourage schools to be able to do to and to do on a wide scale. So borrowing from this idea of technology, this is another one, but this is really focused on school systems and, and what they're doing. Um, often you will hear uh, a lot of education policy talk about student data and student outcomes. Um, 
and, and we see a lot of that through things like uh, our various standardized assessments and other kinds of tools. One in particular that has been a very big focus, and, and this will continue to be a big focus for the, for our state over the next few years, is a focus on um, the use of relevant, timely data to be able to make decisions about uh, students. The example that's shown here actually is a set of data that was used, this actually was collected by the, the intermediate school district for a particular school uh, up in the Upper Peninsula. And they were looking at data on student outcomes on um, a set of diagnostic instruments. So these diagnostic instruments were um, weighting instruments that would focus on different kinds of skill sets for students to be able to either demonstrate an ability to pronounce a particular thing or to be able to um, to comprehend or have fluency in their in their reading. And so these tools were were used in a very kind of quick manner through about a two minute assessment of each student to be able to quickly see what things are they struggling with, what are they succeeding with. And um, we see similar kinds of things analyzing student data with uh, different assessments they may be using, um, or in this case, uh, this is using data to actually analyze um, what teachers are focusing on in classroom through a tool called the Survey of an Active Curriculum. The idea behind all of this is that we're using the data that's coming out of this, not just to wait on it for a year and be able to say, well, our school did okay in this area, maybe needs a little work in this. We might have some, you know, we'll bring in some professional development around this work. But actually to be able to provide um, very focused diagnostics and supports for students um, with whatever particular strategies they're focused on. So this early example I showed you here that has the red and green pieces to it, the teacher could see immediately what areas of need different students had around different, for instance, in this case, it was, I believe, different um, uh, different use of consonants in, the, in student pronunciation and fluency in reading something. What that then allows them to do is to be able to provide a very focused support for that student. So rather than a student just kind of being pulled into a slower reading group, which when we look at data for years and years and years, that kind of practice has happened and almost never have students been able to get out of that kind of whirlpool of, of being pulled into lower and lower expectations for themselves. In this example, they have, as I mentioned before, this notion of a multi-tiered system of support that basically says, for those students who have a few particular challenges, we can pull them out of the classroom for some very focused activity with a couple students at a time and be able to focus on those, um, those consonant combinations, for instance, in words that they might see and be able to actually bring them back up to speed pretty quickly. Then there might be some students who are struggling with a lot of these things and really need a lot more intensive in-depth support that they can, again, provide through some sort of additional intervention, but it's not something that then drives the student back down forever. Rather, what we're seeing in here is we're seeing a lot of very specific challenges that some students may have just unique challenges to each student. The data is providing information that allows us to make a very focused um, intervention to address their needs. We, if we think of this as being something equivalent to kind of the medical field, and we know the kinds of different technologies that are now available in medical tests that allow us to pinpoint a particular problem and be able to try a very specific solution to see what evidence we get from that. This is that same kind of notion. And it's allowing us to keep students on pace for the kinds of work that, that they might be expected to do so that they're not, in general, kind of put into that other place that is telling them you're a slow learner. And that often, um, at, at least as we look at policy, has kept them there 
for a very long time. We have so many achievement gap kinds of issues in our schools, largely because of policies and practices like that. Whereas if educators were able to use data to be able to pinpoint issues, focus on those issues with students, to be able to bring them up to speed, we're seeing a lot more progress for these students. So this is a practice that's in place now. It's just going to become more and more of a focus of not only our work, but this later example that, that, that came up on the screen last is also looking at the kinds of things that we as teachers do in classrooms and being able to help pinpoint curricular alignment so that if we're seeing that students are not getting exposure to a particular thing or maybe a particular depth of knowledge around it, that we can focus our practice on that. Okay, let me introduce a few others and then we'll see if there's any other questions. These last ones should go pretty quick and I realize we're we're winding down on our time here, which is appropriate for this one. Number eight, this is a change that we're likely to see in, in our school schedules, um, is considering time and schedule options that might optimize learning. This is probably one that you may not have as much direct influence on now, but will likely come up when you are in classrooms um, teaching on your own. Um, for those of <laughs> If you may have children and and uh, see a change in those children from when they're very young to when they get a little older, we recognize that um, students as they're very young tend to be up much earlier in the day and awake and ready for learning earlier in the day. And yet, our policy in many schools has been to start first with older students in school. Start with middle and high schoolers at 7.30 or whatever whatever start time we have, and then wait an hour until the, until the buses are back and then be able to go get those younger students and bring them into the classroom. What we're looking at as a policy change is basically saying, let's, let's use what we know about how they best learn and let's potentially change some of these practices. One of those might be to switch that timing around so that younger students are actually starting much earlier in the day when they are ready for learning. And those older students, where their, their body just goes through kind of a uh, change in the body clock, are able to take advantage of that. And, and we ideally through that have less tired kids, more use, better use of facilities, more efficient use of facilities. We're also seeing some examples of this in schools already taking place, where some schools are scheduling much more like colleges where there may be classes that take place very early in the morning, there may be some that take place later in the day or even into the evening where students can take those classes on their own schedule. We're also seeing uh, considerations for this in the yearly schedule. There's, there's a much bigger push to kind of eliminate the very long summer break that we have in generally in the United States and to move to a system where we're not having this huge gap in learning that takes place, which is also which also tends to require about a month or two to remediate in the fall every year for those students to bring them back up to speed. So these are some examples of this. Another one here, considering indirect influences on learning that lie outside of the core content. Through a lot of education policy, we've seen a focus on um, mathematics and language arts in particular, No Child Left Behind really focused on that kind of policy. Um, and in doing so, a lot of those kind of non-core idea concepts of art and music and other programs have often disappeared in many schools um, because they weren't being evaluated on it. But yet we're seeing that with those, we're seeing huge reductions in what students are able to do in their core content areas because um, we're recognizing more through through neuroscience and through um, just a, a, a better understanding of how we learn in general and, and how schools work in general that um, when you eliminate those kinds of programs, you often end up cutting a lot of the creative outlets and a lot of the opportunities that students have. Um, when speaking with uh, some leading neuroscientists, uh, one of the questions that, that some of our staff asked them was what the, if, if there were a, a single practice that you could engage in in schools across the state to improve outcomes, what would it be? And 
um, the, the response from every one of them was, um, we would introduce music programs across the board because we see that uh, students uh, participating in the process of uh, creating music on their own and playing music, not just listening to music, but creating it, um, increases their, their uh, capabilities across the board in terms of developing understanding. It, it is the, the kind of catalyst for learning in a lot of experiences. So this is an example of a kind of thing that I think we're going to see much more encouragement of in the future is is on um, trying to not only maintain and keep these kinds of programs, but actually develop them out and recognize what they bring to the learning experience for all learners. The last one I'll introduce here gets into this notion of what we talked about very early in this um, on outcomes, the, the notion of um, what our students are able to do. Often in policy, we talk about students being career and college ready which uh, is, is a term that's been thrown around a lot, but it, it's that notion that you're ready to be able to step into this kind of independent learning experience that takes place in, in college or be able to step into a new career experience. Um, but it also requires something more than just knowing a lot of facts. And so a lot of what we're seeing is, is this notion of rethinking what that really means. You hear a lot of people talk about soft skills, about skills of collaborating and communicating, analyzing information or problem solving. The, the notion of this is often introduced through experiences that are not kind of typical classroom experiences, but those experiences that fit some of the earlier examples I mentioned before, like authentic learning experiences. One of the examples that I I put some pictures up here um, around is the introduction of internships not just as a possible add-on um, that might take place for, for learners, but actually as potentially a requirement for all learners, that if we want them to truly be ready for the world outside, that part of that needs to be introducing them through their learning experience in schools um, and doing some of that through internship practices, through research practices, through other kinds of activities that engage them in authentic practice and do so in a way that it's available not just for a few people who want to do this, but it's available and, and a really a, a requirement for all of us. We've seen other countries introduce this concept. We've seen um, some different high schools across our state introduce this. The results have been pretty amazing. And so this is one that I think a lot of schools will be revisiting. It'll probably be visited in the very near future as a possible consideration for um, future graduation from the K-12 system is participating in some sort of internship or other authentic learning experience in, in a field of work or research or, or some other practice um, where students are able to demonstrate and engage in that kind of learning. So that is a, a lot of information I've shared with you. I realize I'm um, pretty close to that, a little past my time here. So um, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for about a, another minute or two. I do need to cut away pretty quickly. But I wanted to post this information here in case any of you do want to follow up or if you've got any questions, I would, I would be very happy to, uh, um, to respond uh, when possible. I also sent along a handout regarding this piece to uh, Professor Rubio. So um, he would be able to share that with you electronically or, or uh, get, get any of that information to you. So are there any quick questions of the group? And if not, I'll I, we'll see here. OK, any questions? I did have one comment, Steve. Sure. That was in um, number five, I think, okay. strategy. Remind me a lot of what the new approach to science, I guess you might call it, um, if you put that graphic up too, um, it's uh, the, the science learning strands that sort of become the basis of re rethinking science learning. Um, this, this, this is exactly the same. It just kind of made me think that we're looking, if, if I can make the stretch, that a studied scientific approach 
to learning, not that we haven't before, but we've been more on the side. Sometimes in the past, teaching is an art, and this tells me teaching and learning is, is a science. It's a studied approach, not, not just an art. Absolutely, and in fact, what's been interesting is that in the last, in about the last decade or so, there have been a number of programs pop up in colleges and universities specifically called it's like an institute for learning sciences. And it's not about learning science, it's about the science of learning and, and, and understanding that there is a, a practice and procedure. It's not just all about an kind of artful technique, but that there's a lot of information that can help drive the process and there's a lot of questioning that we can do. And so um, I, I would absolutely agree. This is something we often see um, in the learning sciences and something that is becoming a much greater focus on, uh, uh, on personalizing le learning for all learners. So, I, well, without any additional questions, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to speak with you. I, I hope you found this interesting. Um, I hope you'll look for some of these interesting kinds of things taking place in schools. And, and uh, I, I truly think you're going to see a lot of this happening in the next three to five years if it's not already happening in some of the schools that you're working with or, or will be working with in, in your uh, future uh, student teaching experiences. So thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, um, if any of you have follow-up questions, please feel free to, to contact me uh, by email. And I'm happy to talk with you more about this, this process. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Yep. All right, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed our presentation, gave you a lot to think about. We'll see you in a month in April, but Epsilon Chi has a surprise for us.